Jim Garrity is a longtime conservative blogger and regular contributor to National Review. His early contributions to PJ Media earned him the honorary title of Pajama Hadeen, which I gather is Pashtun for a pajama-clad warrior. During the 2004 presidential election cycle, he wrote a blog known as The Kerry Spot that was highly critical of Democratic nominee John F. Kerry, which I presume means that he told the truth about Democratic nominee John F. Kerry. In 2007, he developed a new blog which he called The Hillary Spot. It was later renamed The Campaign Spot, perhaps because the phrase Hillary Spot now brings to mind a handicapped parking space, as in, don't leave your car in the Hillary spot or you might get another parking ticket. <laughs> he now writes for a National Review blog called The Corner. He's the author of several books, including Voting to Kill, How 9-11 Launched the Era of Republican Leadership, The Weed Agency, a comic tale of federal bureaucracy without limits, and the forthcoming Heavy Lifting, Tales of Growing Up, Being a Family Man, and The Search for the Good Life. He's a regular on the Fox News Channel and other cable news programs. Mr. Garrity also produces an email newsletter, The Morning Jolt. The Jolt is a daily roundup of news and opinions from around the web, accompanied by, by Mr. Garrity's unique spin on things, which I am very much forward, looking forward to hearing tonight. He's known for having articulated something called Garrity's Rule, that every statement from Barack Obama, without exception, comes with an expiration date, after which it's no longer valid. My personal favorite is, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. <laughs> Mr. Garrity is here to tell us how we can retain our sanity and sense of humor between now and November 2016. Please help me welcome a man who, as far as I know, has never taken a bribe from a foreign government. <laughs> Mr. Jim Garrity. Do you guys hear me okay? Because if not, I'll just shout. Uh, first of all, I want to begin by thanking everyone here for uh, skipping the Marco Rubio event over at Larry Ellison's place. Um, I'm sure you were invited. Uh, I'm sure it, was, it would have been a nice evening as well. Let me give you a sense of what, you, what you're missing there tonight. Um, which was probably, this is very valuable around here, isn't it? You know, I was told on the way in here that brown is the new green. Um, actually, I'm going to take the, you know, my, I'm, gonna, I'm from D.C., all right, so, or, you know, I live in Northern Virginia, a lovely neighborhood called Authenticity Woods. Um, I used to live in Alexandria, Virginia, which is inside the Beltway, a nice little neighborhood called Yuppie Acres. Uh, we bought our house in 2007, and the Obama yard sign came pre-installed. Um, it's, it's probably the single most liberal, you know, democratic locality in the entire area. I, honest to goodness, the first time I went to vote there was primary day. And you can get either the Democratic primary ballot or the Republican primary ballot. I went in. <clears throat> yes, my name is Jim Garrity. I live at 291. They say, okay, oh, this is good. All right. um, okay, sir. And they handed me the Democratic ballot. I'm like, actually, I'd like the Republican ballot. And they just look at me like, why? <laughs> You, you seem normal. So, so I've uh, moved out to Fairfax County, uh, which is probably like 50-50 Republican in a good year, most years like 60-40 Democrat, which for me sounds fantastic, it just feels fantastic. I feel like I've, all of a sudden I'm in, you know, Easy Street. I can actually wear my Gazden flag without having the, you know, Homeland Security drive by my house. Um, but I was saying I'm from D.C. area, and so we're a little more formal than you are out in, in uh, uh, here in Silicon Valley. The acceptable palette for our suits is Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, so I'm actually going to give you a Mr. Rogers moment tonight. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. All right. Uh, um, I got here. Um, actually, a good portion of the reason I'm here is are my friends John and Erica, uh, who have basically been my personal Uber since... Um, flew into San Jose Airport last night, and they just like, as you're getting off the plane, they just yank the necktie off you. You're just not allowed to wear them out here, I realized. It's, under whose authority? Peter Thiel's. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of an interesting coincidence. I'm talking about campaign coverage, what it's like to be covering the campaign, and kind of this, this is going to be our painful season. Because for the last like two and a half years, whenever a group like this gets together, we could say something, you know, like, gah, you know, 
to, oh, the reset button, you know, or Obama doing this. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. And then you'll be here tonight, and they'll be like, you know, man, Rand Paul was awesome in that filibuster about the Patriot Act. And like half your friends will be like, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> or, you know, Jeb Bush, isn't he? You know, I like what he said the other day. And all of a sudden, there's this awkward silence. Like, oh, you're one of those. It, it's, it's that moment with the ballot box again or something. So primary season is that time of year where, you know, usually I, I, you know, they ask me to write something um, uh, on the poster tonight. I, you know, everyone here has been so nice. It feels like this is not a, a political organization. This is a big, fun, wacky family reunion. <laughs> and primary season is that awkward moment where you bring up your uncle's drinking problem. <laughs> where all of a sudden we realize, well, we don't, all disagree, we don't all agree with this. In some years, okay, there's a general consensus and we're all fairly conservative. But actually it does feel like that there is, there are some, we, we as Republicans, we as conservatives have some big things to talk about. There were some people who really thought this, this NSA domestic surveillance is ridiculous. Um, like you guys, not only that do I have, uh, 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 you know, people, you know, I, I'm on Twitter. You guys are Silicon Valley crowd, you should know what that is. Um, I have the Obama administration following me on Twitter in an unmarked car. Right? <laughs> Some gentleman was describing seeing drones outside his daughter's workplace, to, you know, and, and like, I guess it may have been a personal one. And maybe drones are really this useful tool for the police and someday they'll need it or something. But let's face it, what do we know drones for? Blowing people up in far off countries, all right? So no, don't worry, these are gonna be totally different drones. These are gonna be polite drones. Um, I, I, I'm of two minds on Rand Paul. That first filibuster, like not only was it a huge success, not only did it really put him on the national map, he was so reasonable. Because all he was asking was, because this all started because he asked Eric Holder, do you believe that you have the authority to drone kill an American without trial on American soil? That's all he wanted. And then you know, Holder wouldn't give him the answer of, no, we're not allowed to kill people without you know, judicial review or a warrant or anything like that. So he has to talk for 13 hours just to get people to recognize, no, you can't blow him up at the coffee shop because you decided, well, he seems like a suspicion. You know, he seems like a suspicious character. I'm sure they used the uh, Janet Napolitano uh, Homeland Security Directive. Well, if he's got a Gazden flag sticker, you know, <laughs> probably a terrorist. Drone him just to make sure. Um, but then you get to the Patriot Act and all of a sudden it's a much more divided level. Uh, th this uh, trade policy you mentioned earlier, man, you know, you lost me the moment you said more authority for the president. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, they're like, oh no, this would be really good for the economy. I'm like, we'll still need it in 2017. <laughs> All right? No, no, it'll be, it'll, you know, enormous exports. Hmm, nah, no, not this whole additional you know, thing. Look at it this way it's a trade deal that no one's allowed to read. <laughs> what? <laughs> do, do you remember the secrecy around NAFTA? Do you remember, like, you had to, like, break in like Tom Cruise into the vault and you know be hanging from wires to get a copy of NAFTA. Like why why all this secrecy for a trio? All if, if the only thing I thought of a trade deal, we send you more of our stuff and you send us more of that that shouldn't be ultra what what are we sending them? Warheads? Nuclear uranium? Well, actually Hillary already did that. <laughs> God, I love it when a crowd gets something like that. Okay, you're <laughs> the comment about my uh Notorious driving record. I mean, I'm no David Letterman. Um, when Marco Rubio gets a speeding ticket on his boat, the New York Times will explode. Uh, so I, I was trying to think about, I've been, you know, my, my beat at Re National Review has been campaigns and elections. <laughs> and you probably think, Jim, there aren't always campaigns and elections going on. You really pulled a fast one over your editors. And that was true for a while. But then the problem is, one, is that we kind of ended up in this, this status of the permanent campaign. Pardon me, a Rubio moment. <laughs> you just need to irrigate me tonight. Um, I'm going to be three pounds lighter by the time I finish. Um, that, uh, that, that you had this, this um, increasingly not useful campaign coverage, particularly during primary season. I mean, I don't know whether you guys like Rubio or don't like Rubio. Did the fact that he's gotten an entire four tickets since 1997, how many of you are like, well, I can't support that guy? <laughs> Keeping in mind, the president gets a motorcade. 
Like, if you really think he's that dangerous, give him the motorcade to keep him off the roads. You know? uh, I, I don't know how many of you are on Twitter. We had fun with the Rubio crime spree hashtag. It's kind of this like communal comedy project where you're just trying to come up, what else has Rubio done? Uh, high on the list for me was um, red wine with fish. <laughs> White slacks after Labor Day. Come on, man. That's really more of an East Coast waspy joke, so thank you for getting that. Um, so, <laughs> I've been covering campaigns for a long time. As you said, you know, the Republican primary season is my least favorite time of year because all of a sudden Republicans just get really hostile towards each other. And uh, we, we all relate to it. We all have our passions. We all you know, find our guy. Now, I would be arguing with you that you really should not be falling madly in love with a politician unless you're actually like dating them and married to them. You know? <laughs> Um, because ultimately, at some point, they're, they're going to break your heart. At some point, they're going to make a compromise. At some point, they're going to do something, you're not going to like it. And that doesn't mean you have to like throw them out. It just means you recognize, okay, they weren't great on that issue. Uh, former New York City Mayor Ed Koch used to say, if you agree with me on 8 out of 10 issues, you should vote for me. If you agree with me on 10 out of 10 issues, you should probably see a psychiatrist. <laughs> um, so as we went into this cycle, and boy, does it start earlier every year. Um, I kind of recognized that I wanted to do something useful. I, as I said, the, the, do you feel like you learned a lot from the parking ticket investigation, you know? <laughs> um, and I was thinking about, like, so what, what actually is, I started to say, okay, you, you, you kind of know some of these guys. Rick Perry ran last time. How could be, you know, there are a couple of reruns. In fact, I really kind of thought you should get, to get them together in a group. Um, it feels a little bit like the uh, Stallone movies. The, repl you know, <laughs> the replacement, you know, this kind of the sense of like, look, there's no place else for them to go, except on the primary trail one last time. Yeah. <laughs> Santorum's the goody two-shoes, Perry's the crazy one. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of this sense of like, all right, I want to illustrate something. So I actually started writing about chapters of, you, you can you know, go on their websites and see their tax plans and all that stuff. And by the way, you should. Like, we, we should ask hard questions about policy. But probably, you know, people feel more connected to the president than any other office that they run. I think we all kind of feel like as Republicans, we're try they're, they're still trying to figure that out. Because you, you saw these maddening poll results in the exit polls in 2012, where people said they felt like Romney was a stronger leader. They felt like he had better ideas. They felt like he'd move the country. You're like, oh, look, this is great. And then they said, does he care about like you? And he lost that one 81% to 18%. Meaning there were people who voted for Mitt Romney who were fairly convinced he didn't care about them. You know, they're, they're, one of the problems that I find the more I cover politics is that everyone in this room, you're here because you care. And first of all, let me get, God bless you for it. Because it's a lot easier to think about the Kardashians. Or not, maybe, maybe it's not. Or you know, the San Francisco Giants. Or, or the, the life has a lot of things outside of politics. In a little bit, I'll talk about the value and the importance of having things in your life beyond politics. But like, if you're, you know, and I'm sure you know either your, your crazy lefty friends, or your strictly apolitical friends. They don't worry about Russia moving into the Ukraine. They don't worry about ISIS. I mean, every day you wake up and you can find something. <laughs> All right, there you go. Every day you can wake up. You just get the feeling that ISIS is turned to, they turn into like Jerry Bruckheimer producers. Like, well, we've done the beheading before, but this time we'll do it with the ocean behind them. And we'll say, we're coming for you, Rome, you know. Um, or, or, you know, it's, it's not enough to kill the Jordanian pilot. Let's burn him alive. Bigger explosion. These guys are horrible, and they're freaking us out. And the president, you know, he gives us these inspiring talks of, well, we, um, we don't really have a full strategy on that yet. <laughs> what have you been doing, Mr. President? Like the selfie stick pictures. Maybe you didn't need to do that. Maybe you could have spent a little more time on the ISIS stuff. Um, I try, as you can tell, I tried, you know, before I came up here, I said I provide my own animation. Um, and I don't want to depress you, but I, I, I did find out just a couple of days ago, it was this rather horrifying you know, exchange at the White House where they asked Josh Ernest uh, something about you know, have they moved forward on a decision on whether they'll ever put ground troops in Iraq to fight ISIS. Maybe you like the idea, maybe you don't like the idea. But the answer was, well, this is an issue that the next president is going to have to address. Not so subtle way of saying, we're not solving this problem. And, and I just kind of, you know, are there football fans in the audience? Okay. 
ISIS is on the march. They are killing people. They're trying to wipe out the Yazidis. And the president is lining up. He's got two halfbacks and the wide receiver behind him, and he's taking a knee. We're going to run out the clock. We're, we're done with this fight. Except we're losing. You only do that if you're winning the game. And so we have this president who seems utterly convinced that the, the only way, like, as long as he doesn't invade Iraq again, it'll turn out fine. <laughs> now, admittedly, it'd be kind of a delicious historical irony, wouldn't it? Um, and I guess he's decided he's just never going to do that. So we on, on the right are going to have to have that debate and that discussion. And Lord knows there are days where I feel that, that Rand Paul sense of, you know what? We're done with you, Middle East. It's not us, it's you. We're, 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 we just, you know, the, the online expression is, I can't even. Yeah. And there's no word that goes after that, because you can't even come up with a word for I can't even. And the press of the United States is basically saying, yeah, we're not going to deal with this. Um, we're going to leave it for you guys. But when, you, when you hear about the Iraqi army throwing down their weapons, I should not throw the microphone, um, and running away, and you're looking there and you're watching the, we gave them those weapons. We trained those guys. I mean, and the thing is, you'd like we train them to be American soldiers who don't run away when they see ISIS people coming. Like our guy, like I, I saw American sniper. We shoot them, right? That's that's kind of the game plan. And for some reason, um, like at some point, like you're like we 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 can't pick you up and, and like make you stand at the front and fight these guys. You guys have to. Oh, by the way, isn't this your home? You're supposed to be defending. So we have this, you know, so on the one hand, you have this Rand Paul sense of like, all right, we're, we're tired of dealing with you people. We can't make you want to defend your homes if you don't want to already. Um, John Madden, from the, oh, not too far from Oakland, you gotta wanna. If you don't wanna, nothing we do is gonna make you do it. But the flip side is, all right, let's ignore that problem. Boy, that doesn't work out. First of all, that's, that's, isn't that kind of a tacit endorsement of Obama's approach? <laughs> to say we're not dealing with, you know, this is too hard, we're gonna ignore it and hope it gets better. Um, but you know, that means we have to go back into it. So Republicans, I, I have confidence that we can someday <laughs> have this discussion and elevate it and, and take each other seriously and recognize nobody's got a perfect answer. This is a hard problem that's been gotten a lot, you know, that's gotten a lot harder because the president doesn't want to deal with it. Um, we really didn't do that with the Patriot Act debate. You may recall Rand Paul at some point said that, you know, there are probably some people in Washington who are hoping there's a terror attack so they can blame it on me. Now let's face we all know he doesn't like John McCain, and we all know he doesn't like Lindsey Graham, and they can get on my nerves. They're, they're, you know, we have good reasons to grind our teeth when we hear you know, John McCain's, my friends. But if you think John McCain and Lindsey Graham are saying, come on, ISIS, come on, I'll kind of blow something up with lots of dead Americans in the streets so I can look at Rand Paul and say, Boo, I, saw, I told you I was right. Come on, that's not these guys. On the flip side, so I, I kind of you know wrapped Rand Paul in the knuckles in my column. I said, "Come on, they're not like that. This is that doesn't elevate the debate. That doesn't illuminate anything." How many of you are familiar with New York Congressman Peter King? All right, there are some days you'll love him, and some days he'll drive you crazy. But man, first of all, this guy's never found a government power he doesn't like, and he, I, I'm fairly convinced every night he checks under his bed for Al Qaeda and ISIS. I mean, he's, he's you know, in, in a panic about these guys domestically. And he had said when the, the um, you know, it's every bill that they pass has some sort of acronym that spells out something just right. And it was, it was USA Freedom Act or something like that. Well, Americans are tired of the Patriot Act. But if we call this new thing the Freedom Act, it'll be a lot better. Um, it's been repackaged as new Coke. Um, but so they, they, they have this new thing that's going to be less abusive of the NSA. They put some more, more, you know, more restrictions on them. They pass it, and Peter King says, finally, we have stood up to Rand Paul, Edward Snowden, and ISIS. <laughs> I just finished yelling at Rand Paul to not yell at you people. <laughs> now you're calling it, you're putting, you know, I mean, Snowden, eh, kinda, Rand Paul does defend this guy. By the way, you know, we'll put this as a point against the NSA folks. Whose idea was it to give him the keys to the kingdom after a month on the job? Yeah. I mean, have you seen any interview with Edward Snowden? Does he come across as the most annoying coworker you could ever possibly have? You just don't understand what I'm doing with this server here, pal. The fate of democracy, just refill the water in the water cooler. Come on, yeah, I guess, you know. 
And so, all right, if you want to knock, but comparing Rand Paul to Stice, the Oxford comma is really important in there. Because <laughs> otherwise you're putting them all together. But I just want to observe, of every, I don't know how much familiar you are with Peter King, but basically, throughout the 80s and 90s, um, Peter King spent more time with the IRA than uh, all the characters in those Tom Clancy novels. All right, I mean, Peter King and the IRA were like this, okay? Now, I'm Irish, we're Irish American, we're fun, we drink a lot, we have violent tempers, the car bombs go off sometimes. I get that. I guess maybe America's always kind of put the IRA in this slightly, well, they're fun jig dancing terrorists, so they're not that bad. Yeah, ask our friends the Brits how different they are. But I'm just going to observe that if anybody in Congress is going to accuse another member of Congress of being too close to a terrorist group, Peter IRA King is not the guy who can make that accusation. So I, I, I mentioned we're having these, you know, these public debates. <laughs> you know when the first debate is? August 6th, Cleveland, Fox News. Um, and you may or may not have noticed, by the way, I am totally letting you know what my next article is about, but it's not going up yet. So don't tell my editors I told you this. <laughs> don't, this is totally, well, it's not totally secret, but here you go. Because I, I, I'm working on this and I'm realizing C, uh, Fox News and CNN have ended up having a very big impact on how the entire Republican presidential process is going on and the Republican National Committee has signed off on this and it's probably necessary. You may have noticed we have an entire zip code full of Republicans running for president. <laughs> George Pataki just announced, I was stunned to learn George Pataki's still alive. <laughs> right? Lindsey Graham is running. Lindsey Graham, who, um, single man, uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, not that we're going to read anything into that. They asked him, if, you know, if, unless you get together with somebody in the next year and a half, you'll be the first president without a first lady. And he said, I'm going to have it on a rotation. <laughs> Somewhere Bill Clinton is saying, why did I think of that? You know, Lindsey Graham running for president, there's only two things he could really be want to do with this. One is, you know, Lindsey Graham is a very hawkish guy. He believes that, you know, defense should be front and center. And he really believes not running, he'll win the presidency, but he will shift the debate. He will make an impact. He'll be on national stage. He'll get the other candidates to kind of gravitate towards his perspective. And there's a certain, you know, philosophy that says that can work. The other one might be he just really hates his home state and he wants to make it worthless. Um, it's interesting to speak to a group like this. Uh, my dad is active with the Hilton Head Island Republican Club down in South Carolina. Um, you probably have grasped that in South Carolina, it's not actually, it's, it, one, it's a conservative area, a lot of Republicans. Um, it is, you, you guys are spring chickens compared to the gathering at, uh, at that little, little, little. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's obviously a lot of retirees. Uh, you've heard Florida referred to as God's waiting room. Um, this is that kind of a crowd. Um, I mean, I don't mean here, I mean in South Carolina. And um, you guys have been very nice to me, handling all the fees of getting me out here and stuff like that. Dad's not so nice, uh, and I go and speak to his group for free. Um, but he did create me, so he has that kind of leverage there. But when you have somebody from an early primary state running, everybody else says, well, the hell with that, I'm not running. Tom Harkin ran in, you know, Bill Clinton did not do well in Iowa in 1992. And he didn't have to because Tom Harkin was ruining it for everybody else. And it's interesting, you, you'd think Iowans who, you know, like you're in California, you're the most populous state in the union. You'd like to think you'd have a little bit of say in who a party nominates, right? Just really, you, you know, <laughs> and by the time it gets to you, it's like, if you're lucky, it's two guys. If you're lucky, you, you know, it's, it's like being the last one on the buffet line. <laughs> well, it's Romney or Santorum, so. You know. um, whereas Iowa, um, <laughs> you know the, the Kevin Costner line in Field of Dreams? Is this heaven? No, it's Iowa. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Um, nobody would ever make that mistake. The <laughs> Iowa gets two bites at the apple because you may have heard that they have the Iowa straw poll traditionally held in Ames. Now, if we're Republicans and we're really skeptical of uh, things like Obama's stimulus, why do we run an Ames, Iowa stimulus plan every four years? Because all of a sudden, everybody's got to bring in the media trucks, everybody's got to be in lots of spending. And it, it doesn't count for anything. 
But somehow we've decided that if you're like Tim Pawlenty, two-term governor of a blue state in Minnesota, try to run on blue-collar conservatism, and look, I'll admit, he's not the most exciting guy in the world. He was not a whirling dervish of raw political charisma. His personalized license plate is a random series of letters and numbers. <laughs> but I interacted with him, it seemed like a good guy. He was a serious guy. And he got knocked out because he didn't do well enough in a straw poll that doesn't count anything. And he spent like $30,000 on barbecue for those people there. And they still didn't like him. Lesson, always get good barbecue. But like, and he was always so polite, like, you know, well, it's, it's just been a great honor of my life to, to go out and talk about the problems in this country and the solutions that I respect. And my wife and my family just can't believe the warm welcome we've gotten in Iowa. Well, apparently not warm enough. Just once I'd like to see a politician come out and say, hi, all you Iowans. Yeah, eat that corn, I'll tell you where you can stick it too, okay? <laughs> Who the hell are you guys to knock me out because you didn't like my barbecue and not enough of my people came in for this event that is totally stage managed and all that stuff. By the way, the straw poll is going on again this year in, uh, in a little bit before that first debate. Um, bit of interesting trend this year. Actually, some people are, uh, Bush has said he's not participating. Mike Huckabee said he's not participating. Um, and I was, you know, my editors asked me, get the campaigns to tell you what they're doing for the straw poll. And I called them. And, and I've, I've got fairly good relationships with some of these people. You would have thought I was asking for the Enigma code. They just wouldn't say anything. And what it was was that everybody was like, who else is going? Because if I'm Scott Walker and I jump in and nobody, none of the other guys, it's me beating up Lindsey Graham and George Pataki, well, then nobody cares that I won the Iowa straw poll. But if I go there and I beat the other guys, then it's a big deal. So like at this point, I don't think anyone has firmly totally said we are completely going to be in the Iowa straw poll. So it's, every, like, it's everybody's like this, this like constant, and then somebody's going to jump, and then everybody else is going to either jump back in or jump in, just choose to participate. But all of this is prelude to the Iowa caucuses. Pop quiz, who won the Iowa caucuses in 2012? You're all wrong because they lost ballots and they can't really tell for sure. I'm not making this up. They lost like five boxes of ballots. Do you know what we think of of lost ballots? That's what the Democrats do, okay? We're supposed to be better than that, all right? And, and so I'm not, so on election night, Romney won by like seven votes. They went back a few weeks later and said, no, no, it was, it was Santorum by 30, we think based on the ballots we could still find. And by that point, I'm sure we're Rick Santorum, he's a really godly man. And you know on the inside, he was screaming the F-bomb really loud because he wanted to say, no, I want Iowa, God darn it. Gosh, golly, gee willikers. And they, they totally, you know, ripped, you know, it, you know, the difference between I won the Iowa caucuses or I came within seven votes of winning the Iowa caucuses. You know, it's a fairly significant difference. So we go from the corn pickers to the syrup smugglers in New Hampshire. Um, and let me know, everybody knows which state should go first. Their state. Um, or maybe you guys would say, all right, we don't like, we, we know there are too many crazy people in California. Um, but I, you know, but New Hampshire, I want you to describe this to me. Because you know, you know, look, we all know Iowa was a state that was won by Santorum, it was won by Mike Huckabee. Basically, you win Iowa by being God's favorite. You basically say, well, I, I have an endorsement from the big man. And then your opponent says, oh, yeah, well, Jesus endorsed me. <laughs> and look, I, I you know, uh, I, I'm a very bad Catholic. I have many evangelical friends. I love these people. But the Iowa caucus participation is 55% evangelical, evangelical Christians. That's not the country as a whole. That's not the Republican Party as a whole. So what's happened is that Iowa has turned into this, like, social conservative, like, play-in round, like this kind of special set-aside contest just for them. And it's not surprising that half the candidates say, no, I'm not going to spend time in Iowa. I'm jumping straight to New Hampshire, which is like this, you know, have, by the way, as you, we get closer to campaign season, count the number of times you hear New Hampshire primary vote voters described as flinty. What does that mean? <laughs> They're crotchety, I suppose. They're cranky. They're skeptical. Uh, a consultant once described New Hampshire to me, you go to a New Hampshire town hall, it's really heavily men. It'll be like, you know, 80% guys, 20% women. They're not quite obese, but let's just say heavy set. All of them are wearing red flannel. 
all of them have about three days growth, and they want to know if you're going to cut their taxes. That's their question. That's it. That's, you know, and that's, you know, that's fine. Okay, they deserve a say too, but like all, it's, it's the corn pickers and these guys running snowplow businesses who put two people who get the first vote in, in who they are. And meanwhile, those of us in Virginia or California or, or, this, or like, um, when, when do we get to vote? Where, you know, and so there's kind of been this irritation with these, uh, uh, the primary schedule. I have um, denounced the Iowa caucuses so severely there's a warrant out for my arrest. Um, like, I, okay, you think I'm kidding, and I am, but if I, uh, Liz Mayer is a political consultant hired by Scott Walker, and she reacted to some dispute going on in Iowa <coughs> with the typical snarky derision that I find delicious, but apparently the people in Iowa don't like, and they're, you know, you know so she tweeted these things, less than 140 characters, but this was ominous to the Iowa Republican Party. Apparently, Scott Walker doesn't appreciate the fine ethanol-based world we'd like to build. And, and you know, eventually, Scott Walker, by the way, Scott Walker, the guy who stood up to like the, the raving maniacs of the unions, right? I mean, they were taking over the state capitol, they're climbing on the walls, they're burning him in effigy, and, you know, and all of a sudden, whoa, 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 Iowa, okay, fine. And he, and he like, you know, you could just see him shoving Liz Mayer in front of the bus. And they, they sorry. I'm proud, you know, both of them will quickly issue statements and I'm mischaracterizing it. They mutually agreed to part ways in the best interest of Liz Mayer and Scott Walker. Now, come on, Scott, <laughs> right? You can take on, like, it, it's as if everybody in that, um, but it's like as if like, there's like this wall of humanity and they all kind of grabbed together and formed like the Voltron of like angry Wisconsin protesters. And, and he stood up to them. He said, no, I think this is the right law, and I'm going to go with it. And, and they, you know, they tried to recall him. He, you know, he's, you know, on um, one of my favorite blogs that isn't written by me uh, is Ace of Spades. Uh, I have no ace. He's a uh, brilliant, funny, occasionally oddball guy. But whenever they need to illustrate a story with um, featuring Scott Walker, <laughs> They use kind of a Conan bar Barbarian type, you know, with like skulls at his feet or something. That is how liberals see Scott Walker. He is the union slayer. And he walks around with their pelts dangling from his belt or something like that. And all of a sudden he's knuckling under to the Iowa caucus people. Like, what, what? But anyway, as I started, you, know, you may have noticed that like my thinking and speaking, I, there's like two pages of notes here. So this is all kind of free flowing. It's gonna be a little bit like the meandering Mississippi River. You know, like 20 minutes ago, he said he was going to talk about the debates. Anyway, <laughs> so the networks have decided with this, you know, at least 16, maybe 17 candidates run. Some people thought, well, okay, do you, do you just get a bigger stage? Do you put them in, in risers? You know, uh, you can only imagine how much, you know, on air time each candidate's going to get if you have 16 to 17 candidates. And so they decided to turn it into The Apprentice, <laughs> which is appropriate because apparently Donald Trump's going to be there. Well, honestly, it's, it's now, it's top 10. Top 10 or go home. Actually, not correct. <coughs> C, uh, CNN's, or Fox News said, if you're not in the top 10 of the, of the five most recent national polls before the debate, you'll be featured on other programming. <laughs> and by that, they probably mean red eye at 3 a.m. Um, so, you know, the difference between 10th place and being on that stage and up there with all the front runners and all that stuff, and 11th place, that's a very big deal. Because face it, once you're one of those six candidates, you're a long shot. Yeah, how, how do you think the donations are gonna do? You know, after you're not on the, you know, the, the, that top stage, while you're in that other programming. But that's almost better than what CNN said, because they said they're gonna have their top 10 candidates, and this really elaborate tiebreaker program, it, it, eventually they, they plug all your poll numbers into the, um, the BCS computer they use for college football rankings, and that degree is who gets, who gets 10th and 11th. Bad news for, you know, some, uh, insert college football joke here. Um, and and you, you basically, for the other six candidates, they're gonna hold a separate debate for the other ones. So it's like the kitty table debate. <laughs> here are the real candidates, the top 10, and here's the NIT postseason tournament selection, where if you really do really well in that debate, you get to say, we're number 11, we're number 11. <laughs> so, by the way, again, I don't want to depress you. Right now, Donald Trump is in that top 10. Aww. 
And for those of you who are saying, whoa, 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 he's not really going to run. It's like, it's like the great pumpkin. You're in the pumpkin, you know, you're always waiting for it to rise up. This is, this is just him, you know, he's got a, a new tie line he's going to debut or some new reality show. Trump the board game has finally been updated or something. But I'm totally not making that up. There was a Trump the board game in the 1980s. Um, but no, I, and I have, um, quoting a uh, highly placed source in South Carolina, who may or may not be my dad. Um, <laughs> Trump's going for it. He's got people in these states and everything. And boy, if you're hoping, well, okay, Donald Trump's going to run, but I hope he takes it seriously, underplays it, quiet, subdued. There's going to be a plane, and there's going to be a bigger plane for the press, and then there's going to be a bigger plane for the foreign press. Donald Trump is going to do really well with all those foreign voters who vote in Republican primaries. And, all right, now, admittedly, my, my opinion of Donald Trump is really, really bi Um But apparently, he, he, on, you know, he's on Twitter, and Twitter is really, really good for getting people to type out the first thought that pops into their mind. And what's the worst that could happen with that, right? So Donald Trump got into some sort of... I need a, I need a clean euphemism for a... I'm going to say urinating match, and I think you understand what I'm going with that with Charles Krauthammer. Right, okay, now, Charles Krauthammer is basically the conservative movement's Professor X, right? He, he basically brings us all together, he says things that so simply and so directly. I mean, think about this guy. He is probably the most influential television pundit in the world. He's, he's a good friend of National Review. Um, the only bad thing I can say about Charles Krauthammer is that in 1997, um, he has a personal assistant. You probably know he's in a wheelchair. Uh, has been in for many years. He he's lives an exceptionally, uh, indisputably full life despite dealing with this very serious handicap. One of these, he has a personal assistant who handles all kinds of matters, uh, both in terms of, of editorial writing and all that kind of stuff, but also, it, as he describes it, um, if the wheelchair wheel breaks, that person has to go get the screwdriver and put on a new one. I interviewed for that job. He said, he had something like 1,500 applicants to be Charles Krauthammer's personal assistant. This is back, look, he, look, he's a brilliant man. And a letter of recommendation from Charles Krauthammer can open a lot of doors. Rich Lowry, my boss at National Review, had one of those, was, was one of them before that. I came in second. The winner had a PhD. And he's fixing wheelchair wheels. Which kind of says something about the influence of, of, of Charles Krauthammer, and that's like, Oh my God, 20 years ago. Um, I've gotten old. But the, the just being that he's the probably, can you think of anybody more beloved on the right than, than Charles Krauthammer? And, and Donald Trump, I'm, I'm not making this up as on Twitter. He's saying, you know, you know, he plays a smart guy on TV. All right, let me stop you right there, Donald. Stop it. You go home. You go sit in the corner of Trump Tower. That's <laughs> so what you want to say. You're fired, right? You know? In fact, Charles Krauthammer is the one guy who has the authority to fire Donald Trump from the conservative movement. You know? Um, I don't think Charles Krauthammer even noticed, but like, so, so, you know, Donald Trump will be the candidate for all those Republicans who don't like Charles Krauthammer, both of them, one of them's named Donald Trump, so he's going to be on the stage, you know who's not going to be on the stage at this point? Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal, who, uh, you know, look, I wrote a profile for him back in 2011. He was running for re-election, and you know who the Democrats got to run against him? Nobody. They found some school teacher, but there wasn't even some podunk state legislator who wanted to make a name for themselves, all right? He had done such an amazing job taking that state from where it was in 2007, not too long after Katrina. You remember the Democrat, uh, Blanco, chose not to run again. And there's two. One, she'd been a miserable failure, and that's always a good reason to not run. But there were not a lot of other people who wanted that job because being governor of Louisiana starting in, in 2007, it was going to be a really hard job. You may recall that uh, Jindal had run um, four years earlier, came close and lost. Can't help but notice that Kathleen Blanco kept calling him Piyush, which is technically his birth name. But let's face it, when you're, when you're calling the Indian guy Piyush, gee, what kind of subtle messaging are you trying to get with there, right? So Kathleen Bonko, let's face it, beats it with racism. And um, by the way, is it nearly 8 o'clock? Wow. I have like 14 minutes worth of material. Short version. 
<laughs> uh, Bobby Jindal would not be on that stage. Carly Fiorina would not be on that stage. Right? I mean, isn't she the most pleasant surprise in this cycle? Right? I mean, you know, for the few people not uh, applauding, I'm guessing you got laid off at HP. Um, <laughs> Look, maybe she's not meant to be president. Maybe she could be uh, the running mate. Maybe she'd be somewhere in the cabinet. But I'm just going to observe. You know, you guys have been a pol you know, follow politics a long time. I've been covering it for a long time. How many times have we seen, I'm a successful businessman. So I got to work in politics. I will tell people to do things, and they will do it. Because that's the way it always worked at my company. Right? I mean, you've seen, and I, I don't mean this to, to bash, you know, people who've been successful in business and, and, and uh, corporate America. It's a good skill to have. You do know how jobs are created. But we've just seen the amateur, the people who just, you can tell, have not spent any time studying the political system and, and campaigning and messaging and all. Like, look, running for office is a skill. If you didn't, you know, if, you, if, you, if it was easy, everybody would be able to do it. And I guess if there's anything that drives me bonkers about Republicans these days, it's this sense of like, well, the people will see that I'm right through the truth and clarity of my statements. Yeah, yeah, ask Romney how that worked out. You know, like, communication is a skill. And, and Carly Fiorina, lover or hater, she has prepared for this, right? I mean, you know, people make fun of her because she didn't get one of her, uh, the, the, uh, the, the internet URLs. She didn't buy one of them. She goes to do the Seth Meyers show at, on, uh, at NBC, and Seth Meyers is ready to give her grief about it. She's like, oh, by the way, I just bought SethMeyers.org. It redirects to my home, my campaign page. <laughs> and you could just see Seth Meyers, who, oh, by the way, uh, was MC for an event at the Clinton Foundation. Keep that in mind for all the jokes you hear from him over the next year. Um, you could just see his face kind of like crack, and that kind of sense. Just, like, just, just the thinking to say, they're going to bring up the URL. I'm gonna outfox, like, you know, like, she wins like three points just for preparedness. Uh, she would not be on the stage. At this point, John Kasich would not be on the stage of the first debate held in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> that kind of, like, that's got a sting. Um, and the other ones were Pataki, who's just like, reminding us that he's alive. Uh, uh, Lindsey Graham. Uh, Rick Perry's on the bubble. All right, now, Rick Perry, I was talking about tr trying to do better campaign journalism. I got a chance to talk to Rick Perry about his years in the U.S. Air Force. Um, love him, hate him. It was really nice to talk about not something political. You can find his tax plans and all that stuff, but how did it shape you? Would you like to know that the second most frightening experience Rick Perry who ever had in the cockpit of a jet was when the engine exploded? That's the second most frightening experience. <laughs> So I'm like, all right, first of all, tell me about the engine exploding, but then, now I really want to know what the first, aliens, right? You know, what, what you know? So the, it was flying a C-130, it's flying it back from Bermuda, they had sent somewhere for hurricane assistance, they're coming back. In a Lethal Weapon-esque detail, he's like three days from retirement. He's like, like a week away from leaving the, the Air Force. There's a, you know, engine uh, up heat in the third engine. Well, that's really intense heat. Red light's on, that probably means fire. He asked the guy, look out the back to see if there's an issue with our engine. The guy looks out, <laughs> uh, propeller parts are flying off, and uh, 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 as he described it, some strong language was used at the time. <laughs> I told him to calm down, and they went through their checklist, and they, it, it's a C-130, it has four engines. You have three spares, so they were able to make an emergency landing, and everything turned out fine. But that's the Right. The single most frightening one was flying through a thunderstorm somewhere over like Belgium and Europe in the 70s. I don't know if this is a pilot crowd. If I say the term St. Elmo's Fire, does anybody think of something besides an 80s movie? Right? Like lightning and blowing and all that kind of stuff. And apparently it just starts glowing through the instrument panel and the windows and all that kind of stuff. And I said, you know, earlier, it must have looked freaky as heck. Um, I'm using my clean language here. And uh, apparently that one, obviously the, the you know, Storm is knocking around. I said that was the single most frightening. Uh, that one blew up virally, like tons of shares on Facebook and Twitter shares and all that kind of stuff. And I got the feeling this is what people would like to know about the candidates running for office. Again, it, it may not tell you everything about what they're going to do in office, but what shaped them, what makes them, and in the case of Fiorina, the, the men and women that they are today. Um, what did they learn? What was the hardest moment of their life? That kind of stuff. And that's what I'm trying to tell you more about not parking tickets and those fancy $80,000 boats. Um, you didn't really talk about the Democratic side of the, the primaries. Any oh, comment there? Sure. Uh, I was going to say, you mean Hillary Clinton and the tomato cans. Um, look, you know, 
Martin O'Malley, he will do for America what he did for Baltimore. Uh, Bernie Sanders, he's got some fascinating thoughts on what's going through the heads of men and women. I guess at some point he'll tell us what's going through the head of Mr. Jenner or Ms. Jenner. Um, I, you know, Sanders basically, every time, you know, he's a crazy enough guy as is. It really doesn't help that every time I see him, I picture Doc Brown from Back to the Future. <laughs> America, we've got to get you back to the 1917 revolution in the Soviet Union. So, I always love it, you know, you call Bernie Sanders a socialist and somebody objects. You're like, no, really, look, go check. He's literally a socialist. Um, and then there's some other... Uh, uh, hand puppet who's running up against Hillary to be to thrown into the meat grinder. Oh, Lincoln Chafee, yes, who wants to take us on the metric system. You will get my standard ruler from my cold, dead hand. And I mean cold in Fahrenheit, not Celsius. I went through, you know, I wrote something in the corner about a week ago, and I just went through every song that had a reference to miles or inches or something like that, and I just said, you know, you can't ask the proclaimers to say, and I would walk 870,000 kilometers. Yeah. There's no way Trent Reznor is going to be 23, 23 centimeter in nails. One of the other ones. Anyway, you got the idea. So now I feel time. Do we have the cards, or are we still, still sorting through? Uh, we, we do have some coming in here. Yeah. Um, what format would you suggest for the GOP debates? Okay, presuming we can't lock them all in a house like Big Brother, and just watch them interact for hours and hours. Um, okay, the simple, if you really have 16 candidates, then to me the simplest answer is split them into two groups and do it over two nights. And give eight, you know, pick names out of a hat, do however you want to do it. Eight of them get to talk about these issues one night, eight get to talk about it the, uh, the next night. Alternatively, if the problem is, you know, we feel like there's, you know, they're, 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 we just don't get enough chance to actually spend time with them, that each one of them is going to get like five minutes, then we just take a cable channel and make it the GOP debate channel. And it just goes on forever. Like you just show up and debate for a while and you go home and then some more guys come and it just, it just, it just turned into easy going. Oh, let's see what Santorum's saying tonight, you know. But again, splitting it up seems like the best one. Um, and, and give every, because, you know, here's the thing. At this point, a poll is measuring name ID. Well, how do you get name ID if you're not up on the debate stage or you get to say something where people can decide whether they like you or not? So it's, it's very much a uh, chicken in the egg, circle of life symbol type uh, situation, so. All right, everybody seems to have their favorite. I've got about uh, four or five cards here asking you to comment on various candidates. I'll just name them and you can sure. choose which ones to comment on. Ben Carson, Mike Huckabee, and sure. Ted Cruz. All right, Ben Carson. Um, God forbid, anything, I have two boys, ages five and seven. God forbid anything ever happens to them, I'm running to Ben Carson. Like this, you can't say, Ben Carson, what does he know? <laughs> Neurosurgeon, it's not brain surgery. Um, and yet, Ben Carson, you know, he, he sends out emails saying, well, I am not a professional politician. Yeah, it shows. Um, and then he'll say things like, I, I don't have any, you know, he, he emphasized, need political experience. He has other people who will, who will help him with that. Well, last week, his campaign manager, finance director, and like two other guys, high ranking guys, all left. Um, now, there are people that, that really, you know, like, he can, it's not going on, but like, maybe you do need some people who know about politics together and stuff like that. Like, I, he's a brilliant guy. I just think it, you know, it's very tough to have an entry level job. Your first job in politics is president of the United States. At the very least, you should have, like, run the Normandy invasion or something, okay? When Eisenhower shows up, yeah, remember, remember Nazi Germany? I took care of those guys. Right? That, that kind of, you know, gives you a little status. Again, brilliant guy. I just think it's going to be a little tough. And his, does, his mouth does run away from him. And you're probably, everyone in this audience is like, thinking, oh, yeah, Jim should talk. Um, Mike Huckabee? This is a really fan. Okay. How cynical do you want me to get? Okay. Don't tell anybody I said this. This is a fantastic way to get him a show on CNN in 2017. Um, look, I... Here's the thing. Um, he's an engaging guy. He's a likable guy. Um, he, he made the very interesting choice to not participate in the straw poll in Iowa. And this is a guy who won Iowa back in 2008. So, um, but I just look at the guy, and he'll say things that will come out wrong or be controversial or something like that. 
And I will, you know, write something and say, yeah, that didn't come out well. And I'll get people to say, Jim, you're not an evangelical. You just don't get it. Right. And uh, so are a lot of other voters. You know, if, if the entire electorate were evangelicals, he'd be doing just fine. But, you know, you have to be able to appeal beyond your base. And I just don't know what that's going to be. He's an extremely likable, engaging guy. And in fact, he may argue, you may argue, effectively the president of socially conservative America, or arguably the, the president of evangelical America. And that's nice, but I need, we need somebody who could be president of all the, pres all the Americans instead of the, you know, president of, uh, you know, the blue enclaves right now. Uh, other names or other folks you wanted to, uh, now that I'm alienating the crowd? Sure, so uh, here's one, another one about uh, another candidate. Given what happened to Romney in 2012, uh, given that business people generally have fired people somewhere in their careers, is, is that disqualifying? Can a, pers a business person ever win? <sighs> um, you know, the Clinton Foundation laid people off. I don't hear them, you know, that doesn't seem terribly bad, you know. You weren't processing the bribes quickly enough, so we had to let you go. Um, I mean, we basically had a favor factory running out of Foggy Bottom for four years, and they're going to throw anything at any one of our guys. Um, I, there's a part of me that feels like uh, Romney could handle that better. And I, I kind of feel like you have a, you can do one of two things. You can try to say, well, it wasn't that many people, or, or something like that. Or you make the principled stance of like, hey, Actually, he did kind of say at one point, I like being able to fire people. What he was saying then in the context of is that the federal government almost never fires somebody. Okay? So you may have heard me mention at some point, I wrote the weed agency. Lord knows there are an enormous number of people. Uh, the book that frustrated and confused marijuana fans all around the country. I'm not making that up. In Amazon, there's one really angry review. And people might say, Jim, wasn't calling your book The Weed Agency a cynical way to appeal to this audience? <laughs> yes, yes it was. And so is my claiming that the book was printed on rolling paper, so they should buy two copies. <laughs> but I wrote a novel about uh, the federal bureaucracy and why it is the way it is. And it's meant to be a funny, uh, enjoyable story about why DC works the way it does and how there's kind of this permanent bureaucracy. Ronald Reagan said the closest thing to immortality in this world is a federal agency. Um, and so, if Ron, you know, and I kind of feel like you look at, because it's interesting, right after the 2012 election, remember, healthcare.gov goes under. Hey, nice, nice work, you know, AJ, nice work, Sibelius. You know, you had, you ever seen that meme, you had one job? Well, in this, Sibelius, you did have one job. The president's going out there saying, oh, it's going to be a couple glitches, but it'll be just like Expedia, Travelocity, all these great things. You know, demonstrating, by the way, President Barack Obama's never used Expedia or Travelocity. He's already had some staffer doing this stuff. So this is entirely theoretical to him. Um, the VA scandal. Like, like, people, veterans died. Remember we were like really, really out, really, that. You can tell, by the way, I'm still on East Coast time. So this is uh, 11, this is the local news for me. Um, the, the, you know, the VA scandal, we were furious for about two weeks. And then we went back to forgetting about veterans, because we do. Um, the one, you know, basic competency of government, like, don't let the vets die waiting for care. That's kind of a basic, right? You know, that, that's another you had one job moment. If you're gonna tell people, legally require people to buy health insurance, you notice the administration keeps bragging about the enrollment numbers? You made it illegal to not have it. Why are you so proud of yourself? <laughs> if I could re legally require everyone to buy a copy of the weed agency, I would, well, the sales are doing fantastic because you'll find them if you don't buy it. But a lot of this, again, it's very hard to believe this doesn't start at the top. I mean, you know, because again, um, uh, Shinseki, Shinseki at the VA scandal said, you know, I, I he, he, he did seem a little shell shocked. No pun intended. Where he said, "Like I, I really, we're getting dishonest reports from people in the field." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people lie. Do I need to show you the House episode where everybody lies? Right? I mean, the, you just kind of assume that. Well, if the field offices said everything was fine. Everything must be doing fine. And you're looking at this and saying, like. How, you know, if, if Obama had said, Shinseki, you know, this is when we did need Donald Trump for a moment to say, you're fired. Sibelius, you sent me out there with my pants down to say how great the website was, you're fired. You know, if Obama just would let his heads roll, we'd, we'd like the guy a lot more. 
Like, he, you know, uh, on Twitter today, there was a big debate about whether federal workers are overpaid. In some cases, I'm sure they are. But if you saw the incompetent one hand, it wouldn't be nearly so bad. Because you'd be like, okay, there's some sense of accountability. It's the high pay and lack of accountability that makes the federal government so uncertain. Lois Lerner. This woman is a one, wa is a one woman walking EMP pulse who can erase any computer file she comes in contact with. Hillary's thing, she just invited Lois Lerner over. Lois, go stand over there. And there it goes, great, so. <laughs> I'll do one or two more, I feel like a good point, but you know, about two minutes you'll say, yeah, he should have ended on the Lois Lerner joke. But anyway. <laughs> oh no, we're, we're not done yet. You've mentioned Twitter a couple of times. Can you talk about the influence of social media and alternative media on the decision in 2016 and maybe how that might have changed over the, uh, since the previous cycle? Sure. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many people are on Twitter in this crowd? Okay, pretty. Um, for all of you who aren't, if you find yourself being too productive, um, way too much time, you feel like your life is just, you need something to suck you into. Um, so that you can find yourself arguing with some stranger who keeps calling you an id idiot but the O and the I are reversed because he can't spell. <laughs> and what's fascinating is that thanks to modern technology, you know, I, I am old enough to remember just you know, the, the journalism right before the dawn of the internet. On my college newspaper, we had some crank who would like send us stuff in the mail. And we'd get out and it'd be like, turkey feathers and glitter and, and cra it was weird. They were, you know, small bones, hoping they're not human, you know. But you kind of admire that crank because she took the effort to put this stuff in the envelope and pay for the postage. She had to write out all those crazy screeds all by hand in crayon. Today, just about anybody can be, you know, sent anything. So I will be there playing with my boys or it's a nice evening with my wife and what the hell <laughs> no you're a dumbass i don't you, and, and and you know and, and of course you know you can my poor wife you can imagine how great it is to watch your husband go from zero to furious over and like honey who said that dsq 47 and he's got 16 followers, honey. I'm not taking that from him. You have too few followers for me to continue this conversation. <laughs> Call me arrogant. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Twitter is an amazing time suck. Uh, as I was mentioning to John and Erica, uh, who are not on Twitter, so don't follow them, um, that, uh, that they said, look, uh, that, that basically, you can, it gives everybody in the world the ability to say whatever they, they know, they see in front of them instantaneously. As I mentioned, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> Ask Anthony Weiner. <laughs> I know this is very far from the question asked, but I feel the need to tell the story. So a year ago, I'm promoting the Weed Agency, and the publisher gets me booked on Real Time with Bill Maher. In fact, the picture of me somewhere. Now, you're probably like, Jim, what the hell were you thinking? I had a book to sell, right? Publisher wanted me to do it. They'd actually asked me to be on before, and I know, I've, I've seen the show. It's like Hollywood celebrity, crazy angry lefty, conservative punching bag, right? Gee, I wonder what role they want me for. But they have, so, you know, so they, they say, yep, we're going to have you on. The other guests were, Ralph Reed, for better or for worse. Ralph Reed going on Bill Maher's show. Talk about the Christian in the lion's den. As I told him afterwards, you can't be that surprised when the lions win. Um, <coughs> oh, the filmmaker who makes really weird movies. Oh. Tarantino? No, uh, not Tarantino. You, If I were, a, if I were a, a worse guest speaker, I'd look it up. But basically, uh, he's got the pencil thin mustache. John Waters, right? Okay, so, by the way, John Waters really got along well with Andrew Breitbart. Learn something new every day. Anthony Weiner is on the program with me. 
boy, you want to talk about a hand you're not so sure you want to shake. <laughs> Bill Maher, of course, and by the way, you know, so Bill Maher, like, you know exactly what you think of him. Always a little more interesting on the Islam stuff lately, hasn't he? Uh, but I was able to tell Bill Maher something he had never heard before. I loved you on Max Headroom. <laughs> There's like four people who remember he was, he was actually played one of the bad guys on that show. But anyway, so it's Maher, John Waters, Ralph Reed, uh, Anthony Weiner, myself, and Nicole Wallace, who you may best remember from stabbing Sarah Palin in the back after the 2008 campaign. They told me, don't worry, there's another Republican on, the screen, uh, on stage. Yes, Nicole Wallace, great. Um, and it was one of the surreal evenings of my life. It was, for, you know, I, if you ever had the chance to be on the Bill Maher show, yeah, you're, you're smarter than me, you're not gonna do that. Uh, one hour of live television, no commercial breaks. I'm there, and you know nobody in that audience is there to see me, right? I am just there, hey, I got a book, please, please buy it. Um, I, I think I acquitted myself okay, not great. I kind of knew it was not going to be, you know, a warm, friendly crowd. Um, retrospect, I should not line afterwards because it's a very, you know, the producers say, no, no, about two thirds of our audience is lefty, but one third of the audience, you know, wants to see people disagree with Bill Maher. Well, they don't go online, apparently. <laughs> everyone who thinks I, you know, I won't use the strong language, but everyone who thought I was terrible, they were online telling me about that. Um, but there was a very interesting side effect, and this may bring us kind of full circle around to the, um, the, the discussion of social media in the 2016 campaign. First of all, three people in my neighborhood, hey, hey I saw you on Bill Maher, I love that show. They didn't say you were good. <laughs> they didn't say I loved you. But you were on it, and all of a sudden that made me somebody in their life. And then finally on Facebook, uh, Facebook, as you know, is a really useful tool for staying in contact with old friends, uh, stalking old ex-girlfriends, <laughs> and seeing who from high school has gotten fat. Um, there were people who, you know, look, now I've, I've been blessed in life. I've written two books, I've done a bunch of television, uh, lived in Turkey for two years. I, I've done a lot of great, you know, but being on Bill Maher's show is the punching bag, is the one thing that impressed my friends from high school, right? <laughs> Which kind of says something that everything else, National Review, Fox News, Greta Van Susteren, CNN, Jake Tapp, none of that stuff reaches them, but Bill Maher did. So, uh, you asked about the, the uh, right, one useful thought, since that was a long meandering, hopefully funny <laughs> anecdote that didn't really answer the question. Um, I got together, uh, there's a, Every conservative blogger, you know, we don't all know each other. We're like one degree of separation away. So February 2013, uh, you know, obvious reasons we're all in a deep, deep funk. Um, there's this nice organization called the Franklin Center. It's not explicitly conservative. It's dedicated to good journalism. It just happens to do a lot of really good journalism on wasteful state government spending and things like that. They did a conference out in Arizona. And they all kind of got together and said, all right, what did we do well in this cycle? What did we do not well in this cycle? What do we need to do better to get our messages out and all that stuff? And one of the interesting revelations was there is an audience on Facebook that does not come off of Facebook. So if I'm writing something great for National Review and it's not getting shared on Facebook a lot, people are never gonna see it. The other interesting thing is if you look at what's trending on Facebook, yeah, there's a lot of celebrity news and all this, but there's usually some political or some, you know, what you and I would consider to be serious news pokes through there, and that's how some people see it. So, uh, needless to say, National Review, almost every journalism institution started amping up its media promotion efforts. And if you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, if you're on this, do us a favor. You see something that's really good and, and you know, yeah, it's a great argument or that really makes a good point, share it, please. Because it, it's the only way we're going to reach certain people who are never going to visit our sites and stuff like that. Um, I guess probably it's good to wrap up with that. Any other, you know, move on to the next one or? Yeah, we, we got a few more here. Um, I know I, I asked the audience not to ask yes, no questions, but this, this one's worth throwing out there. When you leave here tonight, are you going over to Larry Ellison's? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I am going to be collapsing after I leave tonight. Uh, somebody, you know, uh, said they wanted to do an interview with me afterwards. And that seemed like a really good idea until I realized that in my mind, it's 11.25 right now, and I've usually been asleep for like 25 minutes, so. Um, I don't have narcolepsy or anything, so you don't have to worry about me falling off the stage, you know. <laughs> Bob Dole in Chico, California. I've fallen for Chico. Um, 
But uh, no, I will not be uh, hanging out with Larry Allison. I'd like to. If anybody's got a spare invite, you know, just to see what it's like. But uh, I, I imagine you're probably having like your drink brought to you by or like that. Something really high tech for that. So. All right, we got, we got two more and then we, we can wrap it up. Um, how would you suggest we overcome the obvious liberal bias of uh, the mainstream media, which most Americans do seem to watch? Um, I see people who say they, first of all, like this, what I described earlier with the social media phenomenon, in a way that's kind of an advantage. Because yes, they're not reading National Review, or they're not reading your favorite conservative site, but it probably means they're not really reading the New York Times or the Washington Post or anything else you know, like either. Right? I mean, so there, there's, there's kind of an opening, there's an opportunity there for us. Um, I remember one of those guys who, who actually remember the media, perhaps, if, if not being, if it was never good, it was less bad. In fact, my colleague Jay Nordler likes to say, no, we used to have a biased media. Now we have a partisan media, right? Because remember, 2012, Mitt Romney as well, that was terrible. This morning in the New York Times, the story, Marco Rubio's personal finance troubles. Now to summarize it for you, and by the way, actually, wait, Marco Rubio in his book writes all about, yeah, you know, he was, he was a young guy, um, he, was, he was, got married young, he had a kid young, he lives in Miami, which is one of the more expensive places in the country, you're like, well, why don't you move? Well, he's a West Miami city commissioner, he kind of has to live there, and then he's in the state legislature, you can't say, well, it's my honor to represent you, but it's really expensive to live here, so I'm going to go live somewhere else, that's, that's not a good political strategy. Um, so he, the, the whole story, look, he's been open about having financial troubles in his, his earlier years. But to the New York Times, is he really a financial conservative, is he really a fiscal conservative if he's got issues in his own past? <laughs> By the way, the New York Times Incorporated has an enormous amount of debt and an underfunded pensions. <laughs> so, who's the free spender now? Um, how do we, rep I'd really love to have a newspaper where you just pick it up and it tells me what happened. Not what I should think about it. Not, you know, just, just tell me what happened. Um, I don't know if we're ever gonna get that. I do think that we need to, um, it, it's interesting to see the number of resources that have gone into actual news gathering. Um, if you're a, a subscriber to National Review or you've been a long time fan of God bless you, thank you, pay my salary, thank you very much for that. Um, but we do a lot more journalism. I mean, I've been instructed, go out and find scoops. Go out and find information that nobody else has said before. Uh, we're not just an opinion anymore. And I think you're seeing conservative institutions to say, all right, we have to go out and, you know, find, and if you find a big enough story, it will blow up big. Uh, James O'Keefe, you may remember from dressing up like a pimp and going into the Acorn offices, right? That was a huge story that the, you know, the media was forced to cover. Now, the only flaw in James, you know, I, I've hung out with him a few times, seems like a really bright, driven guy. The only thing is that his whole thing is about exposing the hypocrisy of the left. And here's what I think is the real, the Rosetta Stone problem of, of the problem for us. Liberals don't really care if they're hypocrites. Right? I mean, have, you, have you noticed some suspiciously green lawns from your liberal neighbors? Right? No. What are you another drooling? Right? You know, how are you getting that water? Um, you know, so when you expose, uh, Michael Moore has armed security, right? The guy is Mr. Anti-Gun Controls, you know. Um, <laughs> Michael Bloomberg, Mr. Anti-Large Soda, has like horrible eating habits. He will eat salty food off other people's plates and stuff like that, right? Liberals don't, you know, like, and I've, I kind of figure that, okay, my sneaking suspicion is that none of them actually believe any of this stuff. It just makes them feel good. Right? So, which is why, you know, Joe Biden gave like 300 bucks to charity a few years ago. <laughs> now, his family's been through real tough stuff, so I shouldn't make too many jokes about that. Fill in your other typically miserly, you know, liberal here. So, you know, we'll all be nice to the Biden family. Um, but you can find many, oh, Bill Clinton. Boy, he stood up for women, huh? Right, you know. Um, I wasn't even trying that one. Wow. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next one. I'm not going to top that. So, All right, last question here. If you were asked to give advice to the Republican Party on how to actually win the presidency, what would you emphasize? That's a really good question. Um, here's what I think. We've been in... Uh, there's a guy on Twitter, he also writes for his own site, you know, he goes by the Red Steves. Don't ask me why he picked that name. 
But he said, if it feels like the country's been in a depression for six years, it's probably because it has. And I don't just mean a economic depression, although I think economic hard times are a big part of it. I don't think, you know, uh, you know <laughs> to quote our previous Secretary of Defense, the world being on fire, that's certainly a big part of it. But I think we really, look, when we lost in 2008, you could almost understand why. Right? Here's Barack Obama, the first African-American president of the United States. You know, we were going to, we, we, remember what's going to improve race relations? Right? Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Other than Baltimore and Ferguson and, you know, a whole bunch of other places. And we, we, like you, we didn't necessarily buy into it. You know, every statement from Barack Obama comes with an expiration date. I said that because, but I phrased it that way because, you know, you call him a liar. No, no, no. I think he kind of meant it at the time. And then it got hard. <laughs> and then it was going to cost him something to keep his word. And then he just kind of forgot about that. You know, we're, we're going we're to agree to public financing. Oh, wait, they put me on equal terms with McCain? No, we're not. But I've created the parallel public financing system called people giving me money privately. Mr. Pre or, you know, <laughs> Senator Obama, it doesn't work that way. You're not, you're, you keep redefining words to mean what you want. I think we really, uh, I, I don't know who I'm going to vote for. Um, I'll, I'll announce it when I decide to vote for Virginia. But if, if we have one, we may have a convention. You know, I got to go to Richmond if, if, if that. Because, hey, you know, what? It's only a presidential nominee, right? Who wants to have a big say in that? Um, but when Rubio came out, he, he has a great speech about he, he has, you know, He's been given this speech a million times. But he talks about, my dad worked as a bartender in the back of the room so that someday I could be up at the front of the room. And he talks about, well, obviously, with such love for his parents, but also recognition of that is one of the things that has driven this country, the sense of like, we'll, 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 we'll pay that price now. We'll work hard right now because we want to have that better future for our children. And look, there's been a lot of awful things that have happened in the Obama administration, but that, that nagging sense, you see the poll numbers, Americans don't think their children's lives are going to be better than theirs. That gets us right here. And they kind of have this nagging sense of you want to see somebody come along and say, no, it's going to be better. We're going to make it better. We are the exact country we were not that long ago. Uh, in fact, I have a very big, uh, here's my good closing wrap-up point because my throat's starting to go. Um, I mentioned my friend Ace of Spades. Ace of Spades kind of, you know, um, can get a little down sometimes. And, and he started talking about, he's like, you know, we say we're a great country. We're not that great anymore. We're a lazy country. We're a whiny country. And, and he goes off on this, and look, he can find examples for each one of these. And, and I kind of, you know, saw it and felt some consternation. I said, look, Ace, yes. Those are the people who you see in your social media stream. Those are the people who are covered by the media. There's always been a freak show in this country. You want to see other, the other side of America that doesn't get that attention, go to your local PTA meeting. Go down to the school bus stop and talk. Go to Little League games. Go to your church picnics, your temple picnics, your, hell, your mosque you know, get-togethers. Just, just go and, and see lots of Americans who are still working hard who are still trying to do the best for their kids, who are still trying to raise their kids right, teach them the right values. There are a lot of Americans out there, and they just want somebody to stand up for them. They've been doing the right thing their entire lives, and somehow they've been villainized. Somehow they're the problem. Oh, you with your, your carbon emissions and all that stuff. Well, how the heck do you expect people to get around, right? And so they've just kind of been demonized for six years, and this, pre you know, remember when Rudy Giuliani got in this enormous amount of trouble for say, suggesting Barack Obama doesn't love his country? You can agree with it, you can disagree with it. But I'll make there's one element that's almost always there in every single Barack Obama speech. All right, you know, anything. Fourth of July, the LeBron's at the White House for the latest championship celebration. You know, whatever event, he'll get together and he'll mention something like, you know, you know, there was a time in our history where people who looked like me were treated differently or something. Or we're still haunted by the problems of division. You know, there's always something about... Yeah, here, here's the subtitles, if there was some sort of like, you know, truth in air. There was a time in this country when we sucked. And then I came along, and I made it better. But we still have Americans who suck. They're terrible people. I, I, I hope I don't, Jory, you're, you're a California crowd. You've heard worse language than this. Um, and there's always this kind of, well, there's something wrong with us in America. And I just, I'm tired of the President of the United States telling us how bad, no, okay? You haven't done anything much better on your watch, Mr. President, okay? And just talk about how great we are. But one of the things that got Barack Obama elected in 2008 was people thought, oh, you know what, first African-American president, 
We will overcome our legacy of racism and all these sins of the past, and we'll be on, things will be getting better. Pick Rubio, pick anybody, you know, Bobby Jindal's the son of immigrants. We have a bunch of children of immigrants who can say, look, my family came here because they knew things were better here. And that's why I'm here and we can still be this and we can still be great. And, and I just want somebody to come along and just energize us in that. And I think if we do that, I think the electoral college, all that kind of stuff will take care of itself.